So um, as Paul uh, mentioned, uh, we're here to talk to you today a bit about our book, our newly uh, published book, Structural Change, Fundamentals and Growth, uh, a framework in case studies. I, um, it, the book is edited by um, myself, uh, Danny Roderick, and Claudia Sepulveda. Um, we're sad that Claudia couldn't be with us here today, but she is in Chile. Um, so let me just uh, tell you um, how I'm going to proceed here. Uh, I'll begin by um, providing some highlights from the country studies, and then um, it, the overview of the book and some highlights from the country studies, and then Professor Roderick will follow on with some more uh, deeper insights and some um, more recent uh, results. So you've seen the, the beautiful cover. Thanks to PRC, or CKM, excuse me, for, for putting all of this together uh, very patiently. Um, I have a bunch of acknowledgments that I'd like to make. Um, first, uh, Claudia from the World Bank, um, she has been with this project since uh, it began in 2012. And without her, this book would never have come to, 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 uh, to fruition. Um, the, the volume was, the, the research was funded by the World Bank Knowledge for Change program. We'd like to thank Leita Jones and Gabriela Calderon, uh, both at the World Bank. They also helped us organize a, a, pre, a conference where uh, book uh, chapter authors came and presented their work, and we um, talked about the framework, and we all uh, gave each other feedback. We're extremely grateful um, to the Publication Review Committee at IFPRI, and especially, uh, especially Gershon Feder. And um, we would like to, to, to acknowledge uh, the CGIAR research program on policies, institutions, and markets, PIM, led by IFPRI. Uh, we also would like to thank Laura Wallace, who tirelessly edited the book. Um, and then, of course, our deepest appreciation goes to all of the scholars who contributed to the book. We have uh, a number of them in the audience. And if you're here and I didn't manage to see you, please raise your hand. But we have with us. Remy Jedwab sitting in the front row here, and we have Devashish Mitra sitting in the, in the second row, and we have our very own Danielle Resnick also in the front row. Finally, we would like to thank Xinxian Diao also in the front row, and Ann Harrison for their encouragement throughout the process. So um, what, what is this structural change, fundamentals, and growth, the framework? So basically, um, the basic idea is that labor productivity growth, or growth in output per worker, the thing that really determines in, income per person in a country, uh, can be decomposed into two components. One is within sector productivity growth. And you're all, I'm sure, very familiar with this idea. We're all here at IFPRI interested in, for example, raising productivity growth in the agricultural sector. And we think about ways in which that can be done, whether it's through improved seeds, irrigation, and so forth. Um, what's less, perhaps, familiar is the kind of labor productivity growth that comes about as a result of structural changes in the economy. And to fix ideas, uh, so this is, this is, the idea is moving workers from relatively low productivity sectors, which often tends to be the agricultural sector, into more productive sectors such as manufacturing. And by doing this, a country can get a significant boost to growth in labor productivity in a relatively short period of time, unlike within sector productivity growth that tends to take a lot of time. Um, so just to fix ideas, we have uh, here a picture of the gaps in labor productivity uh, in sub-Saharan Africa across nine countries, the nine countries included in the Groningen Growth and Development Center database. And you can see from the picture, um, Across the horizontal axis, we have the share of total employment. Uh, these are averages across these nine countries. So on average, uh, in 2010, 62.3% uh, of the employment uh, in sub-Saharan Africa was in the agricultural sector. <clears throat> but uh, this sector is well below the economy-wide economy average productivity, which we mark with this red line uh, at 100. So, Productivity in the agricultural is only 35% of the average. Um, whereas, if you look at manufacturing, for example, um, the orange bar 
that that w that is uh, 171 or 70 71 percent above average productivity. You can see in this picture that if we moved labor out of uh, agriculture and into manufacturing, this would create a significant boost in labor productivity. Uh, and this is what we mean by labor productivity growth as a result of structural change. So now, I, 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 to, to get a bit more into the framework, I would like to call on uh, Danny Roderick. He is the inventor of the framework, and I think that he can do uh, a great job of explaining this to you guys, and then I'll, I'll come back with some results from the country studies. Thank you, Maggie. Um, one of the um, aspects of, of this, the, the approach we took was to distinguish between um, what we call the, um, the, the fundamentals versus the, the structural challenge, structural change uh, challenges to growth. And I think the point here is to underscore the, the very important role that structural change in the way that Maggie just uh, described can play in promoting economy-wide labor productivity. And secondarily, to underscore that uh, the traditional way in which we think about uh, getting economy-wide growth, which is uh, in terms of increasing fundamental capabilities, uh, misses uh, some of the more specific and more directed uh, policies that can be targeted more specifically on that second uh, challenge, the structural uh, change challenge. Um, so, what we mean by the fundamentals challenge is, is essentially the things that we associate with the, the fundamentals behind what drives growth. So, if you want to think whether it's this, the neoclassical growth framework or the, the non-neoclassical or endogenous growth frameworks, uh, we think that behind sort of economy-wide labor productivity, there are things like uh, human capital, there are physical capital, other endowments, uh, sort of overall institutional quality uh, um, and, and overall governance and so forth. Uh, so typically these are the kinds of things that we stress in terms of improving the, uh, the basis for economic growth. Um, and thus these, this collection of basic determinants is what we call fundamentals. Um, but if you look at growth from this perspective, uh, that many of these countries are in fact deeply dualistic, which is that there are very deep uh, differences in labor productivity across different sectors, uh, you see that often uh, a, a very important uh, driver of growth is simply going to be speeding up the rate at which labor and other resources are moving from these low productivity to high productivity activities. And, and the key point uh, is that you can get a lot of structural change uh, uh, with more directed policies that don't necessarily or, or are not entirely just as fundamentals. Uh, that is that, that you know, one way to think about the, uh, the East Asian industrialization experience is that, that precisely that they got very rapid growth, uh, uh, not necessarily because they accumulated human capital or physical capital very rapidly, they did. But if you actually look at the, the drivers of growth, especially early on, a lot of it was just simply getting people out of, uh, from agriculture and more traditional low productivity activities into urban and especially industrial kinds of activities. Uh, so the challenges, the policy, the, the, the policy background to these kinds of, of these two uh, challenges overlap, uh, but they're not exactly the same. In particular, uh, in one extreme, you can imagine a country not doing a whole lot in terms of improving overall institutions, but being very good at moving people from uh, uh, traditional agriculture to industry, and you get a big kick early on. Perhaps it won't last. Um, and in that way, you know, you can get, if you look at this sort of uh, distinction between, uh, you know, sort of having you know, slow or rapid transformation on both of these kinds of challenges. Uh, so that would be a country that um, in the sort of rapid structural transformation, uh, that's the top right-hand side corner uh, without a whole lot of investment in fundamentals. And you can get uh, certain, you know, spurts of growth and, and rapid growth for periods of time. Um, but if you go sort of the diagonal, um, is, is the case where um, a country is actually working purely on, on fundamentals, that is, in, you know, improving its human capital, in, improving its physical capital, improving its institutions. Uh, but these are things that will really pay off a lot in the long term, perhaps, but are not things 
that are going to necessarily generate very rapid growth uh, because uh, they require essentially lots of complementarities. You have to put institutions and human capital and the physical capital all together. And, and these are things that actually, um, uh, certainly in the convergence framework, uh, are going to produce a slow to moderate growth and slow to moderate convergence, but not necessarily very, very rapid one. Um, and, and, and the countries that in some sense are, have done the best are the ones in the lower right hand uh, um, uh, corner, uh, which have invested in fundamentals, but also have paid a lot of attention to the structural transformation challenge, as we call it. Back to Meg. <coughs> okay, so um, just a couple of highlights from the um, case studies. Uh, to whet your appetite, to get you to read the book, um, but not too much. Um, so the, the case studies included are Brazil, Botswana, Ghana, Nigeria, Zambia, India, and Vietnam. Some of them middle income countries, some of them still quite poor. <clears throat> so um, the case of Brazil, you can see, uh, let me just explain the green bars. Apologies to people who are colorblind. The green bars are within sector growth and the red bars are the growth that comes from structural change. And what you can see in Brazil is that the period 50 to 64 and the period 65 to 79 were, were periods, especially 65 to 79, where there was rapid industrialization. We associate, not exactly, but those periods more with import substituting industrialization. And then we can see that from 80 to 94, um, and then 95 to 2005, growth slowed down considerably. And particularly in the most recent period, um, the, the bulk of growth has come from uh, within sector productivity growth. This is a little unfair to Brazil because it makes the growth story in recent years look so bad. And we know that after 2005, growth picked up. But still, uh, primarily from uh, within sector productivity growth, which is not that surprising because Brazil is a country uh, that has gone through a lot of structural changes already and has a relatively low share of the labor force still in agriculture. Uh, then we have Botswana, another middle income country, which um, is interesting. Uh, I think you have on the left hand side these same um, a bar charts that I showed you earlier on to describe this process, this uh, phenomenon of structural transformation. Um, what you see in uh, 1970 is that uh, more than 80% of Botswana's labor force uh, was in agriculture. And you see that in uh, 2010, uh, only a little under 40% uh, of the labor force is now in agriculture. Botswana reaped a, a lot of uh, labor productivity growth as a result of structural change. Um, but uh, one thing I think and, and that would be interesting, especially to the folks here at IFPRI, is that you can see that Botswana still has a a relatively large share of the population in agriculture. And um, these, this agriculture is uh, really tough. I mean, you, those of you who know Botswana, it's in uh, dry areas. There's not enough rainfall. Uh, the challenges are significant. And um, it's unclear which policies uh, will be able to get Botswana past that point. But this is one of the things that Arthur Lewis pointed to as one of the very, very, very uh, challenging aspects of development. Uh, then we have Ghana, thanks to Remy, who's here with us. Um, the interesting thing about Ghana, if you see, since 1992, Ghana has been growing. Uh, growth has been based uh, largely on structural change. And you can see that most clearly in the graph to the left, where uh, the green, uh, the Panel B shows uh, changes in employment shares. And you can see the green line shows the employment share in agriculture falling significantly. And the blue line shows the employment share in services rising significantly. And you can see the red line at the bottom, which is the share of labor in industry. Industry includes not just uh, manufacturing, but also, for example, gold and other um, uh, commodities. But uh, what's interesting about Ghana is um, or not, or, or possibly problematic, um, is that Ghana's uh, structural change has really been based on a shift out of agriculture and into services, and manufacturing has simply not taken off. 
uh, in Nigeria, um, again, we see that productivity growth is mostly a result of structural change, and that shows up in the left-hand um, chart here, or, or, or bubble graph here. What we have there are, across the horizontal axis, we have changes in employment shares, and on the vertical axis, we have uh, sectoral productivity as a share of uh, economy-wide average productivity. And the size of the bubbles are the size of the employment share. So you can see that um, Nigeria still has the majority of employment in agriculture, uh, but over that period, 96 to 2009, if we believe the data, the share of employment in agriculture fell by about six percentage points. But, um, and it increased, uh, you can see it increased in manufacturing, construction, transportation and communications, finance, insurance, and real estate. And it also increased in very low productivity services, that bubble to, to the bottom right. What's um, troubling about the situation in Nigeria, you can see it on the right-hand side. You just look at those uh, two negative numbers in the bottom two rows all the way to the right. That's the change in labor productivity between 96 and 2009. And I think Daniel will be talking about this more, but you see that within sector productivity growth in manufacturing and finance and business services, the sectors that are supposed to be, we hope, driving productivity growth in the economy uh, because they are the modern sectors, uh, th productivity growth in those sectors was actually negative. Um, in Zambia, we have, um, again, an experience that's not that atypical of Africa, uh, except it's it's even more um, exaggerated in the case of Zambia. Zambia, between 91 and 2002, you had copper mines shut down, you had privatization. You actually had uh, what Danny has referred to as structural change in reverse. You see people moving out of urban areas and back to rural areas and into lower average productivity sectors, which was clearly a drag on labor productivity growth. But from 2002 to 2010, um, you see a reversal in this trend. So structural change led growth has been positive, although um, I hope Danielle will talk about this later, but she, she notes in her chapter with James Thurlow that many of these new jobs are in informal uh, sector, in the informal sector, not well paid, not um, um, very reliable and so forth. Um, and finally, India, and we have Devashish here with us, um, one of the most interesting things about India is um, it. So you. So let me just describe what you're seeing there on the screen. On the screen, um, the the bar chart shows um, by uh, state um, within sector productivity growth and structural change for the period 87 to 2004, and the blue bars are within sector productivity growth, and the red bars. Our structural change. So if you kind of squint your eyes and, <laughs> and average them out, you, you can see that uh, within sector productivity growth has been more important for India than structural change. One of the interesting um, features here is that there are significant differences across states, and this is highlighted in the chapter by um, Asan and Mitra. And uh, they, they highlight uh, Gujarat, uh, which is the fourth from the bottom, um, and they show that 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 state has grown the most rapidly and based on perfect within sector productivity growth um, and they they uh, cite some work um, that's showing that this is a largely a result of investments in infrastructure investment in agriculture and in that state you actually saw an increase in employment in agriculture on the other hand the second fastest growing state is mumbai and um and um Oh, sorry, state is Maharashtra, and we know that Mumbai is in Maharashtra, and um, there the, the growth is more balanced, and we know that that is uh, at least in part due to the fact that Mumbai is a center for um, high-tech services. So very different patterns. Um, ooh. And, oh, sorry, I, in Vietnam, so Vietnam is also extremely interesting. It's the only country in the sample uh, where um, labor productivity growth has been accompanied by an expansion in modern manufacturing for export. Um, the, left's, the left is uh, labor productivity gaps in 1990. The right is labor productivity gaps in 2008. And you can see that um, the share of employment in manufacturing increased from 8% to 14%. Um, and then summarizing, 
uh, I, I'm just take one second here because I'm out of time. Uh, basically, the dark, the darker colors are the most recent periods, and uh, the upshot here is as follows. Um, apart from Vietnam, we haven't really found any evidence of East Asian style miracles in the rest of the country studies, and uh, again, Danny will talk more about that. Um, the implication seems to be that the kind of growth we saw in East Asia is, is an exception rather than, than the norm. And so for more insights on these issues, and again, for more updated results, I'm going to turn, turn the floor over to Danny.